Perfect. Hi, everyone. Today, I want to talk a little bit about secure software distribution in an adversarial world. I didn't really know what the target, target audience age was, so I translated my title into emojis. So I really hope you appreciate that, because never getting those 15 minutes back, it's, it's not easy. Software distribution. It's an incredibly hard and incredibly ubiquitous problem. Every single one of us has to deal with it. Even from a consumer perspective, we have to update our software on our phones, our applications, so on and so forth, right? Security itself, the security updates are the cornerstone of security, right? The moment there's a vulnerability, the moment there's something that actually happens, you update your system. That's something that you do. And you know you can't really run a one-month-old WordPress version out on the internet. I mean, you can, but you're probably going to get an unintended massive redesign very soon, right? So the reality is that as software developers, not only we have to deal with software updates, we actually have a bigger problem. More and more of our applications are using external modules, are using modules, GitHub, uh, gems, anything that come from external sources by thousands of developers, um, downloaded by whatever package managers, and installed with God knows what infrastructure and what security, right? This is a big problem. And not surprisingly, what is actually happening is that it seems that package managers are a strictly monotonic increasing function. These days, everybody wants to create their own hipster package manager that does X, Y, or Z. And the reality is that none of them are looking at package managers and saying, I'm going to build the most secure package manager possible. This is not what is actually happening, right? So the reality is that you are dependent on every single one of these package managers to get it right. One module that gets compromised, one vulnerability of a package manager, actually compromises your application, compromises your infrastructure. And this wouldn't be as big of an issue if developers actually chose a subset of these package managers, a secure subset of these actual package managers, and they chose, no, I'm going to use this one. But the reality is that that's not actually happening. There's a lot of clueless people out there. And this Stack Overflow question definitely tells me that. If somebody thinks that this script is a good idea or is not sure, I don't want them administrating my security. That, that is for sure, right? So the reality is that when you think of a package manager in the context of security, this is what you think of. This is what you want. You want an imperial walker. You want an armored vehicle that actually can carry your payload. It can sign it and protect it and transport it, right? In this case, it even has freaking laser beams and medium blasters, so how cool is that? Unfortunately, with package managers, this is not what you get. You wanted an Imperial Walker, but you get two stormtroopers with walking sticks. <laughs> and so the first question that people ask me is, what about HTTPS? We've lost all of this effort and invested tons of time into doing transport layer security, TLS. Why can't I just get a Let's Encrypt certificate and then build my own distribution of software? As long as I don't use OpenSSL Verify None and I actually verify the certificate, which nobody freaking does, then I'm going to be fine. And the answer to you is no. Let's think of this case. You have a cloud and you have some software or a mirror or anything and you want to distribute this software. Obviously. I'm very biased, this software looks like a Docker container, not by accident, but you have this piece of software and you want to download it to the customer. So the reality is that if that arrow is HTTPS and if you are actually validating the actual certificate, then you should be fine. You can just download the container or the piece of software and essentially you'll be fine. The obvious problem with this is there could be somebody in the CDN, there could be somebody in the mirror, somebody could compromise the front end system. These are the systems that are the most exposed. So they're obviously the systems that are going to be compromised first. The way that you should think about it is TLS means transport layer security. It does not mean content layer security. So this is clearly not going to solve your problem. And then the second question that people ask me immediately is somebody put their arms up and say, Diogo, what about GPG? Isn't GPG signatures, isn't this a signed problem? Signed software, we, we solve this problem, right? And so <laughs> then I have to go on this story about over and over again, GPG is a building block. The way that people use GPG right now is essentially as a glorified signing message. You pick up your package, 
you GP, GPG sign it, and then you send the signature along with the package. But this is not a solution for software distribution. This is a solution for signing. These are two very distinct concepts. So let me show you a particular example of an attack that a direct application of a GPG signature makes you vulnerable to. This is called a downgrade attack. Let's go back to the situation where we were before. We are a content publisher. And in this case, we've generated a public-private GPG key pair. So now we have our keys. And let's assume that there's some magic way of distributing the public key component of you actually having trust of the user. But now the user actually trusts your GPG key, and all is fine and good with the world. So now you want to publish some software. What do you do? You pick up your private key, you stamp it. You put a green stamp on it, and you push it out to the cloud, to your mirror, to whatever it is. So from this moment on, a user can simply download the package, the software, inspect the signature, and say, yeah, this is good. It's valid. Shouldn't be any problems with this, right? Three months go by. Three months later, what happens is the following. Your package turns out was vulnerable to something. Let's say Heartbleed or, no, better than Heartbleed, let's say Shellshock. Remote code execution as a service on your package. Isn't that great? So now it became red. Your package is red. So how are you going to fix it? Well, you're going to update your package, and you're going to stamp it again. You're going to use your signature, you're going to update the signature, and then you're going to push it to the cloud. And now, you would think that this would be the exact same thing as before, that a customer or a client that has the previous package can simply update it, and that a new client coming along can simply download the latest package that is not vulnerable and just be happy with it, but not so fast. Imagine that there is a man in the middle positioned or privileged attacker. And that doesn't matter if it is our friends at the NSA uh, disabling your TLS, or if it is just somebody compromised your mirror, somebody compromised your distribution system. If this happens, because you use GPG as a direct application of a signature, it means that that signature is still valid. As long as that key is valid, the attacker that is in the middle can serve old content to the user. And remember, it's not just old content. This is shell shock vulnerable remote code execution old content. It doesn't get any better than this for the attacker. They can literally serve you something for which they have a known exploit for. So this is obviously terrible. The reality is that applying GPG signatures, it is not the same thing as securing software. You should think of software security as a holistic approach. You should follow a framework. Once you have your GPG key, what do you do with it? How do you rotate your GPG key? How do you revoke it? How do you actually allow developers to sign some of your packages, but not others? At least not without giving them your key material. So none of these, none of these things have solutions when you're thinking specifically about just signing your software. And this is actually a, hu a huge issue with package managers today. They're either not caring about security and downloading via HTTP. I think we've all seen that before. And they've all been humiliated on Hacker News. And then we've also seen the people that simply use HTTPS. I have a valid certificate. What well, can go wrong? And then we see the package managers that actually do application of signatures. But what they usually do is they do PGP or they use ECDSA or they use an RSA signature, but they just bundle it. They don't really care about this framework of attacks. And they're vulnerable to mix and match attacks, indefinite data, freeze attacks, downgrade attacks. There's tons, tons of attacks that they're actually vulnerable to by not using a framework. So this is really concerning. One quote that I really, really like is, a software update system is secure if it can be sure that it knows about the latest available updates, in a timely manner, any files it downloads are correct, and no harm comes from checking or downloading these files. This is a very high bar, and I think we should absolutely meet it. And so I would like to talk about five different concepts that could actually help us meet that bar. The first one is freshness. The concept of freshness is essentially what would have solved the downgrade attack with the GPG model that I described. Essentially, freshness guarantees that your content is not valid as long as your root of trust, your root key, is valid. That is terrible. You shouldn't do that, which means that you could expire content freely. And another event, advantage of freshness is that if you take time to update all of your mirrors, if something is vulnerable and you take time to update all of your mirrors, some random poor client that is using a specific mirror that turns out got forgotten or doesn't get update ever won't download software that is vulnerable forever. It will immediately know, the freshness guarantee will tell it, that it cryptographically cannot download the software and validate it. So that's pretty cool content. That's pretty cool guarantee. Another thing that we have to think about and start thinking about is signed collections instead of signed objects. When you're thinking about security, specifically security of modules and packages, you think about, I'm going to sign this RPM, 
I'm going to sign this gem, and I'm going to upload it. But that has a ton of issues. Turns out that software has versions. And software versions have dependency on other software that has other versions. So this is not a unit independent thing. You should not look at security of packages as stamping individual packages because they're tied together. If an attacker can do what it's called a mix and match attack, it could actually serve you one version of one package that it knows it doesn't work with another version of another package. So this is a denial of service right there. It will kill availability of your system just because an attacker decided that it can play with different versions that it can serve you. The way that you start wanting to think about this is collections instead. So a developer, instead of saying this package is good, what he says is these versions and this collection of packages are OK to be used. I've tested them. This is actually the state of the world that I want to be in. And which means that all of the versions and all of the dependencies will be resolved within the context of the collection, not within the context of the individual package. Another really important concept is key hierarchy. And this is something that a direct application or use of a GPG key is incredibly bad at. If the key that you're using to sign all of your packages is the root key of your system, then you need it to be online. You need it to be there every time there's an update. How do you distribute this key so other teams can actually sign their packages themselves? Do you give them the key material? So none of these are good answers. So what you actually need is create a structure. You need to be able to have a key hierarchy where the root key, the single key that is most important for your system, and the key that all of your users trust should be able to delegate power down to other keys. And those keys should be, in turn, be able to delegate power down to those keys. And you could create something like this. Now you have a root key that depends on another key that then subdelegates down to other keys. So the down keys, the keys at the bottom, could be your developer keys. And then the other keys could be the organization keys or your team keys. What this means is you never have to share a key material. Dead are the days of you having to send the GPG key private material through, I don't know, AirDrop or a zip file with a password, God forbid. Um, anything like that. Because you can have your own keys and you can simply delegate responsibility to somebody else. Another reason why this is really useful is if you do have a key hierarchy and if keys have different importance, then what you get to do is you get to do super cool stuff. If you put a key on the cloud, so I don't know, on your CI system, every time there's a build, the key on the cloud actually builds with the CI system and the CI system stamps it. Then you know that that key is more vulnerable than other keys. Why? Because it's on the cloud, it's unprotected, the CI system is an online key, it's always using it. So what do you do? You create a key with a shorter expiration time. And the less sensitive keys have shorter expiration times. And the more sensitive keys have longer expiration times. So the key for the CI system on the cloud, very short. The key for your developer on your laptop, longer. The root key should be the longest and should be offline. If you have a key hierarchy and you're delegating responsibility, it actually means that you don't need your root key as much. Because with the GPG model, you need the root key to sign every package. With this model, you don't. You essentially need the root key when you're doing some privileged operation. So it's really important to note that you could have keys and hardware. And that's essentially the ultimate way that you know that your current material is not going to get stolen. You could actually generate keys in hardware and never see the private bits on one computer of any of your laptops. And that's really important guarantee for security. What this gives us, actually, the system, this key hierarchy, another property is transparent key rotation. Imagine that any of these keys are stolen. In the GPG model, you'd have to bootstrap your trust again. In our model, the only thing you have to do is, OK, I have an online key and I have an offline key. My offline key is in my safe. An attacker comes along, compromise my online key. Instead of panicking and just disabling everything and just recreating the whole GPG key and, and doing something, what you do is, OK, you bring your root key offline, you sign a new key, and you transparently distribute it. The customers actually don't see anything because their trust is on the root key that is offline and not on the key that is online. I mean, for all you care, you could actually rotate the key every month. Heck, every day. You could actually just transparently rotate it because you don't know if you got compromised or not. So just keep rotating it. You probably did. You probably, some of your developers right now are pushing their private keys to GitHub. God knows I've never done that. I've never done that. <laughs> Another useful guarantee and the final guarantee that I want to talk to, to you about today is threshold signing. Threshold signing allows you to have a super cool property, which is a piece of software will only be valid if one or more keys sign it. 
What this means is you could have different systems essentially condoning a particular piece of software in a quorum system of like. Or you could have your CI system sign it when it goes through CI. You could have your QA team sign it when it goes through QA. You could have your staging system sign it when it goes to staging and then tell the production system you only run things that have been signed by QA, have been signed by staging, and have been signed by CI. So now an attacker has to go through the chain and either follow the legitimate development chain or compromise all these three systems, right? So this is a really cool property. And you can go wild, right? You can have as many signatures as possible, and you can add tons of things. And another thing that is really important for threshold signing is that, for example, in the Apple versus FBI case, imagine that a firmware update for the iPhone would require two keys, or three or four, but keys in geographically distinct regions. For example, I don't know, Russia in the United States. Now try to get the United States to force the Russian team to actually sign a backdoor into the firmware. That's not gonna happen. So you have those guarantees with crypto, and that is really important for the security of the internet. And so the reality, though, is that these properties have already been thought about and researched. There's an update framework called the Update Framework, which is a very good name for an update framework, actually. It came from the early research of Tor, the Onion Router. They wanted to develop an update system that resisted nation state attackers. So the NSA, China, Russia. And so they came up with this theory and this, this system that then researchers picked upon and created an actual framework around. And so tough, theupdateframework.com is something that you should take a look at. But it's just a generic distribution or a generic framework. So what we did was, at Docker, we impl implemented Notary, which is an open source, opinionated implementation of Tuff, and then you can use today. And then we integrated Do Notary into Docker. So Docker today gives you these guarantees and allows you to download all of your packages, all of your containers in a secure fashion with keys and hardware. And you can do it too. The same way that you integrated Notary, which is totally separate from Docker, you can do too for your packages. So the reality is that I think it's incredibly important that today developers and software publishers, publishers start taking security seriously. They should take care of these very important properties that any software update system should have. So as one of my favorite coworkers always says, when the going gets tough, you should absolutely get tough going. Thank you very much. <laughs>